As a presidential candidate, why should people of color, women, and especially women of color like myself, trust you? What steps have you taken to truly understand the systemic forces that work against these people on a day-to-day -day basis? And what will you do as president to chip away at systemic racism, sexism, and reduce the impact they have on these groups' interactions with law enforcement and government entities? Thank you, Sharon. So, let, my, let me begin by acknowledging that asking a woman of color for her vote, asking you for your vote, is a lot to ask. I mean, it is a lot to ask anyone for their vote, but women of color have been the backbone of this campaign, uh, of, of democratic campaigns, and of this party. And, you know, this is a vote that has been won within living memory. So it's not just expressing a political preference. It is something that was earned with blood and sweat and tears. I recognize that and I'm humbled by that. I'm also humbled by the knowledge of the experiences I don't have. When you talk about how to try to get that understanding, I recognize that I will never have the experience of being in an emergency room, for example, as has happened to so many black women, and have my description of being in pain not believed, which is one of the reasons why black women are three times as likely to die from com complications related to childbirth as white women. Just as I won't have the experience that so many black men have, young black men in particular, of being presumed to be dangerous, just feeling eyes on them as you walk down the street or, or through a mall, just because of the color of your skin by people who don't know you. I recognize that I don't have that lived experience. And so the question becomes, what can I do to try to reach out to those who do and invite them to shape the vision of my campaign? and invite them into shaping the vision of the White House I propose to build. So for example, our plan for dealing with systemic racism, we call it the Frederick Douglass plan. I believe we need to take as much intention as went into the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe and do it right here at home, dismantling the effects of systemic discrimination in everything from the need for greater economic empowerment for black Americans to housing, health, criminal justice reform, education, voting itself, all of this is connected. Now, this plan is the most comprehensive put forward by any presidential campaign as an agenda for black America. And I'm proud of it. I think it's brilliant. But it's not like I sat in a room and wrote it up. The reason that it's so good is that it was shaped by black voices. And in particular, dealing with the intersection of sexism and racism, these ideas were shaped by those who had lived that. And that is what we need to do in the White House as well. This is not going to get better on its own. And you can't just cross out a racist policy uh, and replace it with a neutral policy and expect things to get better. If we want to get that wealth gap that has been talked about addressed, you, you can't just expect it to get fixed on its own. It's why we need to proactively co-invest in black-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to owners of, of uh, in particular, businesses owned by black women, disproportionately, they say they weren't able to get bank financing. When I always ask it, when I see a small business uh, led by the black women who have the best track record of creating opportunities for others. And I ask them, how'd you get up and running? They almost always say cash because of these problems in our credit market that systematically make it harder for black entrepreneurs to make it. We could change that. And we have to change that. It's the same with criminal justice. This is a systemic problem that I have been humbled by. The, the ways in which we have a long way to go in my own city, where I was mayor for two terms, are well known. And they have demonstrated to me that nothing will get better without a systemic approach. And it can't just be one person. To me, the biggest lie this president ever told was when he took that stage at the inauguration. And he said, I alone can fix it. I think nobody this side of paradise can fix anything alone. And that will be at the heart of my determination to include the voices of those whose experience I can't underst not understand from my own life, like the black women who are so systemically harmed by the inequities in this country. But let me follow up on that, because I, you know, we're, we are in South Carolina. Yeah. And in 2016, 60% of the Democratic voters were African Americans. You, you don't have long. You've got five days here to show African Americans and to get their support. Yeah. 
Why you? What do you want African Americans in this state, Democratic voters, to know about you to win them over? What do you want them to know? Well, first of all, it's not just what's in my plan. Uh, again, I believe that my plans are the most comprehensive for dealing with the effects of systemic racism. But it is my determination to make sure that we actually win so that we can deliver on those plans. I know that nobody is feeling the pain of living under the presidency of Donald Trump more than Americans of color. And so many voters I talk to are laser focused on making sure we defeat this president. And this is our only shot. I have the campaign best position to do that. If, of course, we earn that support and earn that vote. And that's what I'm determined to do. And I want every, in particular, black voters who, again, have been through so much to secure the vote and who have felt their vote taken for granted so often. I want you to know I understand that I am not entitled to it. And as somebody who has the benefit neither of decades of experience, so uh, you can see uh, good, bad, and indifferent what I've been like for decades, nor the benefit of billions of dollars to get my message out, I understand that all I can do is stand before you in all humility and share what's on my heart as well as what's in my plans. Right. How does being the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, prepare you to be the leader of the entirety of the United States of America? And how will you compensate for your lack of experience in some of the key issues facing America? Yeah. So it is a leap for anybody to pursue the American presidency. And yet, every single person who's done it has been a mortal with a certain amount of experience. Many of them have been senators, and I don't think I'd get that question, of course, if I were a senator. And yet, you could be a very senior senator in our country and have never in your life managed more than 50 people, depending what you were doing before. I believe that while there's no job like president, there's also no job like mayor. When you're a mayor, you are in an arena where you, you don't just get to talk about issues. You, you don't just have to try to make sure you vote correctly on them. You are accountable for results for everything good, bad, and ugly that goes on in your community. And what we were able to do in my community was take a city that was being described as dying just a decade ago and guide it out of the legacy of the factory closures that had defined the life of our city and into a brighter future. We took action on racial inequities. We cut black unemployment and black poverty faster than what was happening at the national average. We took action on preparing our city for a better future. And there's one other thing I would say about the relevance of being mayor, which is when you're a mayor, you are a walking symbol of the unity of your city. You never forget that it is your responsibility to call together everybody who's part of the community, even those, especially those, who didn't support you politically. That is also the part of the presidency whose absence is costing us so much under Donald Trump. I believe we need the instincts of a mayor to start getting Washington to work a little more like our best-run cities and towns before the reverse starts happening. And I also recognize that, again, nobody does anything alone. One of the first things you learn as a mayor when you are building your administration is that you need to surround yourself with people who have the relevant experience. I never want to be the smartest person in the room on any subject. And I will always want people who are smarter than me at whatever it is I'm asking them to take charge of. This town hall is in the heart of downtown Charleston, but this is not the downtown Charleston that I grew up in, just about seven blocks away from here. Charleston is filled with working class families, uh, many of whom are being pushed out and priced out, displaced as gentrification spreads in our area. Uh, this happens all over the country, especially in brown and black neighborhoods. And I'm wondering, what will you do in order to protect families from being displaced and priced out of their homes? Well, thank you. This is an example of one of those issues that I was talking about of racial justice that won't get better without intention and resources. This isn't just going to happen. And by the way, we should remember that a lot of the racial segregation of American neighborhoods happened because of federal policy. The racial discrimination in access to uh, subsidies for housing, for example. So there is an obligation to proactively do something about this. And yet, what we have under this administration, under President Trump, is the reverse. They actually gutted things like the rules that the Obama administration set up on ensuring that communities affirmatively further fair housing. We would reinstate that, and I'm proposing a 21st Century Homestead Act as part of the Douglas Plan. Unlike the original Homestead Act, that largely led to the dispossession of Native Americans. This would be about addressing the situation where you got families 
mostly black and brown families that got redlined into certain neighborhoods, only to face being gentrified right back out of them once the prices go up. And that is why I believe we need federal dollars to allow families who are from historically excluded communities to take title of properties in those communities and hold those neighborhoods in their original character. Again, this is something we've seen in our own community where Public safety, in my view, depends as much on making sure that uh, the neighbors who have been in those homes and in those neighborhoods have a chance to stay there as anything that, that a police department can do. It's why we directed home repair dollars to disproportionately black neighborhoods in the city of South Bend, knowing that it could make a difference for the stability and character of the neighborhoods. We gotta have a higher than ever level of intention, and again, real dollars, in order to address this federally too.